Today on Celebrate South Florida, we take a cultural journey across the Tri-County area to find the most interesting and unique local artists. In Dade County, we explore the artwork of Miami native Jonathan Riesco, who paints abstract impressionistic art, and Sheila Elias, an accomplished mixed media artist that paints about societal issues. Further north, in Broward, we find out what it takes to become an artist from two professors at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. And in Palm Beach, we meet three members of a group known as the Highwaymen, whose work is recognized as the beginning of Florida's contemporary art tradition. That's today on Celebrate South Florida. I'm Mia Lorenzo and welcome to Celebrate South Florida, a monthly program that profiles many of the interesting people, places and events in our Tri-County area. Miami-Dade County has developed into a world-class destination for art and artists. Hundreds of galleries have made their home in South Florida and the world comes calling every year for the Art Basel exhibition. Today we highlight two individuals that are taking advantage of our flourishing art scene. Art is expressions of creativity and imagination. It tells stories, conveys messages, creates moods. Art appeals to human emotion. Today, we go inside the studios and minds of two gifted visual artists. Jonathan Riesco is a Miami native whose enthusiasm for life is seen in his paintings through bold colors, images, and textures, creating memories of life's experiences. And uh, it's a technique I've been developing for about five years now. It's layers on layers um, of paints showing kind of like the history of the painting as it develops. Uh, yeah, with these, this vertical kind of layering that, uh, that I'm doing, um, it's supposed to convey kind of like this abstract impression of memory, you know, your memory of a certain place, a certain time, a uh, moment in time, a person. Uh, might have been a glimpse, just a split second of something you saw, and it changes immediately. The minute it's gone, the way you remember it is di a little different than it, than it really was. Sheila Elias's work reflects her curious and adventuresome mind, revealing the powerful imagery of a society in turmoil, but still with the promise of hope. I've always done pieces based on the society kind of issues. Uh, when I had my studio in Skid Row in Los Angeles, I hung bags in Skid Row, shopping bags that were made, that I had made, that were six feet by eight feet across the street in Skid Row, and then handed out shopping bags to all the street people. And they, on, the, on the shopping bag was an image of the Pompidou Museum, so it was this, as if I brought a museum to the people that would never get to that museum. I also did a piece um, at Miami-Dade um, downtown and that was called Homeless Powerless. And that one side of the room had all figures with the homeless voice pa newspaper on them. I had cut out these cardboard figures and, and used all the newspapers as their bodies. And they had shopping bags and shopping carts with the same shopping bags that the people on the other side of the room had the Gucci, Chanel, etc., And it showed that both groups using the same shopping bags. Homeless Powerless, it was a very provocative piece. Through their works, these two artists simply tell stories, interpreting their impressions of life's experiences. Through their eyes, inspiration is found everywhere. I, I like to look at things in a, in a different way, like I'm constantly walking down the street and I might look at a tree for five minutes, you know, and my friends are like, hey, come on, you know, let's move along, and I'm like, no, hold on, I need to finish, you know, admiring it or appreciating it, or just I might be taking a mental note of the way this branch was shaped, you know, just the, the, the turn it took or the way the light shined on it, and all, all of those little things, you know, add, add up to an ultimate, ultimate goal, you know. 
where, wherever their place may be, you know. It might come out in my work a month later, it might come out a year later, you know. I feel like uh, the entire universe <laughs> inspires me. I, when I walk along the street, um, different visions uh, invade my psyche, and I feel that um, the way that I see society, reading the newspapers, listening to the news, walking through the streets, it could be a visual or an intellectual choice that I make. I always want to convey to society that there, are, there is hope. The end results of their work can be different between artists, but the creative process is very much the same. Well, for all of uh, my paintings or each series that, uh, that I'm about to begin, I prepare with several sketches and drawings that evolve into other drawings, and then I kind of lay out a map on each raw blank canvas of just the basic composition and layout of each painting. And then from there, it may evolve into somewhat of an organic process where you just kind of go with the flow of where the painting wants, wants to go, you know. It's, you succumb to, to each piece. It's uh, like a dialogue, if you will, that you set up with each individual painting. When I'm in the work and in the middle of it, it's kind of a zen where the work is, the work actually bosses me and tells me what to do at, at one point. The work takes over. And at the end, I eliminate certain parts of it for the good of the whole. I take over. But there's a certain middle section of the creative act that makes you feel as if you and the work are elevated, flying above, and one. And I, I keep on the zen portion of it. Though the artists and the work become one in creation, there's always room for differing points of views. Yeah, I love collaborations. I love working uh, with, with other artists as far as on one piece, whether it's a drawing uh, and just the energy that, that builds up bouncing off each other. It's, it's remarkable. I don't know. It's, it's something you can't explain. It doesn't have words, the energy that, that builds up. And you just literally bounce off each other. And well, recently, uh, recently uh, I just worked with Clark Derbis on uh, an installation in downtown called Crash Site, and that was uh, the wildest thing either one of us had ever done. I mean, it was over uh, 150 feet of uh, crashed car hoods and crashed car body parts that just kind of fit together like a huge collage or mosaic, if you will, that ran the entire uh, interior of, uh, of a building in downtown. And we just, I mean, we had a blast uh, doing it. These accomplished artists have had many highlights in their career. Some stand out more than others. Although Sheila's career has spanned over 30 years and her artwork has been shown throughout the United States, there is one place her work has been displayed she's most proud of, the Louvre in Paris. Jonathan's best show featured the benefits of conversation, nice to meet you through nice to know you, which consisted of 69 paintings, all interrelated, dealing with a range of human interaction. It's a wonderful feeling, I think, just being able to create something, and then when someone purchases your work, that's a, it's a very flattering moment, you know, that somebody's taking something that you made with your hands to, to their house. I think there's two types of people, some that discover it later in life, and some have always, I've always been passionate about it, and always, knew I was going to do that my whole life and would do anything to do it. The passion to create is so overwhelming. These artists are called to their work. Art is appreciated by everyone, especially the artist. For information on Sheila's work, check out her website at SheilaElias.com. And to find out more about Jonathan's work, check out his website at ReescoArt.com. For more information about Miami's art scene, go to the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau website at gmcvb.com visitors. In this next segment, we meet two artists who are passing on their appreciation for art to a new generation of students at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. G.H. Tepper and Howard Katz both believe that education is key to becoming a good artist. I think it's important for an artist to go to an art school because you need to have an intellectual knowledge of what's gone before as well as how to do things so that you don't 
well, one, make the mistake of just thinking you're doing something great, new, and original that was done 150 years ago. And the idea is to be around other artists also, other people who are interested in the same thing um, and doing the same thing so that you can exchange ideas that way. But how do you teach something like art? The first thing an art student has to learn is discipline. They must have things done. You can't make art, a drawing class for instance. You can't draw or learn to draw until you put the point of the pencil on the paper. You're not making art as an art student. You're learning your craft first. And then from there, it moves towards trying to teach them how to make art. It's a lot about technique. It's teaching them materials. It's teaching them um, how to uh, create a drawing and put pencil or charcoal to paper. And when they do that, then it's pretty simple. It's just a matter of uh, explaining to them different concepts about drawing and then watching them do it and guiding them through doing it. My wife believes art is a prayer between you and the great universe. I, however, think it's a disease. You either catch it or you don't catch it. And if you catch it, no matter what you do, 20 years later, you'll still be doing it. And if you don't catch it, no matter what you do, 20 years later, you won't be doing it. Learning to draw is like learning to play the piano. You actually have to sit down at the piano at some point to see how the notes work. And then furthermore, to see if you can make those notes music. Because there's a very large difference between playing notes and playing music. Just like there's a very large difference between putting pencil to paper and drawing an object and making art. Howard and GH teamed up to create an exhibit for the Art Institute, where they could showcase their work for their students. The name of the show is The Property of Objects, and it came about when Gary and myself were talking about really what to call the show, and we were both doing paintings that related to objects in different ways. Mine on a more conceptual level, his on a more direct visual level. He had a body of work he was working on. It lends itself together or the, the work lends itself to show together, not because of its similarities, but because his is much more intellectual than mine. Mine is much more visceral. Um, and I thought that would have been very interesting. With my work, you're looking at the, uh, well, the role of resemblance and how we look at objects, how we perceive objects and color, um, and what is there versus what we think should be there. So my idea was, if I painted the apple red, people would still recognize it as an apple. It's still an apple, but it's not. It's a painting of an apple, and even though it's a red apple, an apple's really not completely red. And then by putting the word underneath, it would then challenge you as far as, okay, here's red, here's an apple, they're all red, everything works. But then if I do cherries, which I did for red also, um, cherries are, are red, and we all know that because we have cherry red, and, Everybody looks at it that way. But with the word underneath is green, it just disassociates the two and you wonder why. And the idea being that even though the word is green, the color is red. And the last one in that series was actually a red herring. Um, and I just did that because I like puns. And a red herring I thought would be fun. And I made the word red blue uh, for the water and that where the fish usually is. So then you have the whole dissociation because one has nothing to do with the other. G.H. has a different perspective. His paintings focus on objects and their importance in the light. These paintings are they're ghosts. They're the things which are caught uh, in the corner of your eye. They're fleeting images that are forgotten. With very few exceptions, some things become popular as collective collectible pieces, but for the most part, they're things that we overlook, and yet each piece has this wonderful richness to it. This old beat up truck, it's nothing more than an old beat up truck, right? But as an image, it's quite beautiful. It has this beautiful texture, and there is something incredibly noble about an old, powerful truck, and yet it just, it had a long, hard life. There was, there was this wonderful faded paint with 
great um, damage that was done. It must have been a horrendous collision. Wonderful deep rust. Um, and it's just, it's sat very quietly in this, this junkyard waiting for its fate. G.H. and Howard are proud of this exhibit, but they feel that as an artist, you never stop learning and growing. Very important professor in graduate school once told me, he said, well, if you've already created your best work, what are you gonna do for the rest of your life? So I hope that each piece